hands together and give a warm welcome to Black Robe Regiment leader, Representative Dan Fisher. I want to thank Jesse and city elders, not only for the stand that you take, but for inviting me here tonight. Now, what we're about to do is we're about to take a journey back to the 18th century, back to a time when the church was the tip of the spear in defending liberty and truth. At a time when our liberties were being trampled by tyrants across the ocean, the pastors led out. Now, this would be a wonderful story, but it has to be more than a trip down memory lane. There has to be some application. And I believe that the stand that they took in the 18th century, at least the spirit of that stand, is desperately needed today. So the story of these men who had to go off to war, hopefully we will never have to do that, to defend their liberties, is applicable to us because we are in a heavy spiritual struggle, in a heavy spiritual war. So we're going to be talking tonight about a time when the church did not apologize for the stand that it took. I hope that you enjoy the journey. God bless you for being here. So let's run all the lights down as best we can, and then we'll begin the, uh, the program. Now sit back and prepare to travel back with us to a time when the American church stood up for what it believed in as we present Bringing Back the Black Robed Regiment. To the pulpit we owe the moral force which won our independence. They prepared for the struggle and went into battle, not as soldiers of fortune, but with the word of God in their hearts and trusting in Him. England sent her armies to compel submission, and the colonists appealed to heaven. John Wingate Thornton Blessed be the Lord my strength, which teacheth my hands to war, my fingers to fight, my goodness, my fortress, my high tower, my deliverer, and my shield. Our muskets leaning against the back wall speak as loudly as anything I might say this morning regarding our present crisis. Today we are called upon to either surrender our liberties, our religion, and our country, or to defend them at the point of the sword. There's no other choice. It's we who would gladly live peaceably among all men we're now compelled to fight. It is therefore, my brethren, an indispensable duty that we owe to God and our country to rouse up and bestir ourselves and being animated with a noble zeal for the sacred cause of liberty, to defend our lives and our fortunes to the shedding of the last drop of blood. <laughs> 
We must turn our plowshares into swords and our pruning hooks into spears and learn the art of self-defense against our enemies. Now there are some who pretend it's against their conscience to take up arms in defense of their country. But can any rational being suppose that God requires us to contradict the laws of self-defense which He God himself has written in our hearts? To be careless and remiss or to neglect the cause of our country will expose us to the displeasure of Almighty God. To save our country from the hands of our oppressors ought to be dearer to us than our lives. And next to the eternal salvation of our souls, it is the thing of greatest importance. A duty so sacred, it cannot be dispensed with for the sake of our secular concerns. The cause of virtue and freedom is the cause of God upon earth. To indulge cowardice in such a cause, it argues a want of faith in God. And he that is so lost to humanity as to be willing to sacrifice his country for the sake of avarice or ambition has arrived at the highest stage of wickedness that human nature is capable of. And deserves a much worse name than I at present care to give him. But I think I may with propriety say that such a person has forfeited his right to human society. The love of our country. The tender affection we have for our wives and our children. Do now loudly call upon us to use our best endeavors to save our country. Either surrender liberty or defend it. It is your choice. congregation I've been your pastor a good number of years but the time has come for me to fight the good fight on a different battlefield to defend liberty both yours and mine it is the right thing to do and if I fall in the fight I hope to see you someday in a land where the shadow of death will never again fall upon us. And liberty is eternal. Men, who will go with me?
far am I from thinking that I am wrong? I am convinced it is my duty so to do. A duty I owe to my God, to my country. That's what it was like to sit in one of the churches in my day, pastored by what we called a patriot pastor. You see, we did not separate our lives into the secular and the sacred. We believe that to the Christian, everything was done unto the Lord. We saw the storm coming. We did everything that we could do, at least we thought, to avoid it. We even petitioned the king to no avail. And finally the storm hit upon our beaches like a wave in a storm. And we preachers, we preachers let out. And we're honored to do so. I've been asked to come here this evening to tell you our story. Now, I know some of you are thinking, well, who's he? Well, my name is John Peter Gabriel Muhlenberg, but you can just call me Peter. I grew up in Pennsylvania among the German Pennsylvanians. My father was Henry Muhlenberg, helped to found the Lutheran Church in Pennsylvania. I grew up in a Christian home. I myself was a preacher as well. By the time the war broke out, I was pastoring in the wilderness down in Virginia at a little place called Woodstock, Virginia, in, of all things, a log church. Now, I know some of you are thinking, well, what in the world then is a preacher doing here standing tonight in front of us wearing a, a colonel's uniform? Well, well, we'll get to that in just a moment. Now, I know that many of you are probably under the impression that we preachers ought to just hide in the back. We ought to not speak out. Well, that was not my generation. Oh, now my generation was also very different in another way. Every Sunday, when we climbed into our pulpits, we did so wearing our black preaching robes. I don't know what your preachers looked like in your day, but in my day, I, as a Lutheran, but the Presbyterians did the same, and the Baptists as well, and the Congregationalists, we all climbed into our pulpits on Sundays looking something like this, additionally wearing our our preaching bands. These were our scarves that were worn around our necks that looked something like this. And every Sunday, this is how we preachers looked. And so here we would stand in our pulpits, and of course we preached the gospel. We believed that the most important thing was the eternal destination of an individual. But we also found in that same holy book much that God had to say about government. Proper government and improper government we call tyranny. And we preached on that too. Now some of you are probably under the mistaken notion, at least to me, that we primarily fought our war because of excessive taxation. And I will tell you that taxation without representation was a familiar phrase in my day. Uh, We did find the tea tax to be particularly onerous. It caused some of my friends to throw a little tea party down in the Boston Harbor, if you've heard anything about that. Oh, but make no mistake about it, my friends. We were not fighting against taxation. That was a symptom. We were fighting against tyranny. And we knew that tyranny, unchallenged, would eventually tell us what we could believe what we could preach, how we would live, and we weren't going to have it. And so we, we took our stand. Now, like many pastors in my day, I didn't just pastor my church. I served in government. I was engaged in my culture. I served in the Virginia House of Burgesses before old King George shut it down. I served there with some fine, fine Virginians. You might recognize a couple of them. A farmer by the name of Mr. George Washington. And a wonderful orator, Christian man, greatest orator I've ever known, a man by the name of Mr. Patrick Henry. Oh, I was there. I was there on March the 23rd, 1775, when Henry spoke at the St. John's Episcopal Church, gave that rousing 
incredibly wonderful speech. Why? I remember it like it was almost yesterday. Especially the words, Is life so dear or peace so sweet as to be purchased at the price of chains and slavery? Forbid it, Almighty God. I don't know what course others may take, but as for me, you can give me liberty or you can give me death. When he made that dagger motion to his chest, we all understood the crisis that was crashing upon us. I went back to my church in Woodstock, but I, I realized that there was something more for me to do. I announced to my congregation that my final Sunday as their pastor would be January the 21st, 1776. I climbed into my pulpit as usual, wearing my black robe. I opened up to the third chapter of Ecclesiastes, my focus was verse 8 where Solomon said, There is a time for war. I stepped down out of my pulpit and I said, Ladies and gentlemen, there's a time to preach. There's a time to pray. But there is also a time to fight. And that time, unfortunately, has now come. At least for me. Now my congregation was pretty accustomed to my being a loud Loudmouth, I might add, soldier in the army of the Lord, but I wasn't quite certain if they were prepared for the sight that they were about to see next because I stepped over to the side and I removed my preaching bands and then I pulled off my preaching robe and I revealed to them what you saw a moment ago, a colonel's uniform. You see, Mr. Washington and Mr. Patrick Henry had recommended that I be commissioned as a colonel of a brand new regiment that we were forming in Virginia, the 8th. Now, not knowing what my people would do, I had positioned a drummer boy outside my church. And I told that boy, I said, Now, son, when I open the doors of this church, I want you to begin to lay into that drum. And so I walked back to the back. I opened the door. And he began to roll on that drum. And then I turned around to my people and I said, There is a time. There is a time when we must defend our liberties if necessary at the point of a sword. To my great delight, my congregation just stood and began to sing the old Martin Luther hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. And if you can believe it, one by one, the men in that little church got up and walked outside and began to sign their names on the muster roll of the 8th Virginia Regiment right beneath my own. You see, I had the privilege of leading those men from 1776 all the way until the end of the war, 1783. We fought at some of the greatest battles of that war. And I found that in addition to being a pretty good Lutheran preacher, I turned out to be a pretty fair commander in the field as well. This is a painting of General Washington and his staff. And if you look to the far right in that painting, there I stand, Lutheran preacher, now commander Peter Muhlenberg. It was such an honor to serve under General Washington. Peter Muhlenberg. He was brave on the battlefield, faithful in the cabinet, honorable in all of his transactions. He was a sincere friend and an honest man. It's almost like I can hear his old voice today. It was a great honor to stand with that man and the other patriots. Now, I told you we were there at the great battles. We were there at Yorktown, for instance. My men and I assaulted Redoubt Number 10, which opened up the way for our, our own forces to force the surrender of General Cornwallis. A very famous painter in my day, Mr. John Trumbull, painted that surrender ceremony. I understand that it hangs in the rotunda of your capital today in your capital city, Washington. In that painting that hangs in that rotunda, you can notice to the right, there are some of us gents seated on horses, and if you look very closely, you'll notice that there I am. Lutheran preacher, now promoted to Major General Peter Muhlenberg. In Statuary Hall, also in your capital, in your capital city, there is something that you call Statuary Hall, my home state chose me as one of their honorees, and there I stand today in your Capitol building, sword sheathed to the left, but flowing over my right arm and back behind me, the robe that I laid aside to lead the eighth. You might say, at least temporarily, I traded in my preaching robe 
for a set of riding spurs because we were a cavalry unit and we gave it all for the cause of liberty. Now, I was not the only one, and I don't want you to think that it was just a little handful of us hotheads. No, it was pastors from every denomination. The Presbyterians were particularly fiery. I don't know what Presbyterians are like in your time, but boy, in my day, the Presbyterians were the hot, fiery preachers. Now, I hear a few laughs. Maybe things have changed since it was like in my day. Here's a Presbyterian preacher for you. This is James Caldwell from Elizabethtown, New Jersey. We all believed he said things just to make the British mad on purpose. He'd say things from the pulpit like, sometimes it is as righteous to fight as it is to pray. Well, if he intended to draw the attention of the British, he succeeded because those redcoats put a bounty out on old preacher Caldwell's head. So, in response to that, every Sunday... James Caldwell would walk into a pulpit wearing two loaded flintlock pistols hooked into his belt like so. He'd walk up to the pulpit, pull out the pistols, lay them on the pulpit, and preach his sermon. Being ready to fight whatever fight was necessary. When he was finished, he'd take the pistols, hook them back in his belt, walk to the back door of his church, and greet his congregation. I've often said a preacher in the pulpit with a couple of loaded flintlock pistols, he takes an offering, I guarantee you, you're giving something. In fact, if any of you men are preachers here, you might want to try that technique next Sunday. It worked for Colwell. Now we can laugh, but you know, it's actually very serious. The British were so intent on silencing us preachers who were speaking out that when they invaded Elizabethtown, one of the redcoats, if you can believe this, jumped over the fence of the Caldwell home, saw Hannah, Pastor James Caldwell's wife, through the window of their house, raised his flintlock, fired, hit her in the chest, and killed her instantly in cold blood. Caldwell helped to do her funeral, left the children in care of some of the townsfolk, and then he was off to Springfield, New Jersey, because his men were fighting the British. But when he got there, his men he discovered were in trouble. They were yelling, Wadding, we're out of wadding for our muskets. Now these muskets that we used may seem primitive to you, but in our day, they were the finest fighting weapons that we could get our hands on. But without wadding, to shove down the barrel to hold the shot tight, they were rendered ineffective. So what were they going to do? Well, Preacher Caldwell knew what to do. He jumped on his horse, and he rode down to the First Presbyterian Church of Springfield, ran inside and began to gather up hymn books filled with songs written by a very well-known hymn writer of our day, Mr. Isaac Watts. He wrote songs like, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. Maybe you still sing some of Watts' songs. Now what is this preacher going to do with these hymn books? Well, he rides back to his men. He begins to throw the hymn books out and says, Men, here, tear out the pages. Use the pages for wadding. So get this mental picture. Here's the Presbyterian preacher, James Caldwell, throwing out hymn books. His men are tearing out the pages, shoving Isaac Watts' hymns down the barrels, firing away at the British, and all the while he's yelling, Give them Watts, boys! Put Watts into them! It's a Presbyterian preacher, James Caldwell. Sadly... Not long after that, a man that we all were convinced was paid by the British, caught Caldwell unarmed, and killed him in cold blood just like his wife was killed. It paid a very high price. Well, I'm here to tell you tonight that there were many, many preachers, many of our church men who paid a very high price for our freedoms, for yours. Let me tell you a story of this, this young preacher. His name was Joab Trout. He was 25. It had to be, let's see, it was well, September the 10th, I would guess. 1777. Yeah, September the 10th. We were camped on one side of Brandywine Creek. The British are on the other. We knew a battle was coming for sure. General Washington wanted a preacher to preach a sermon and buck up the courage of the boys. And so he asked this 25-year-old preacher if he would preach a sermon. It was late in the day, but General Washington, General Anthony Wayne, I, and most of the boys were there. And this young preacher got up there and hurriedly preached a very powerful sermon. Trying to race the sun before it set, he ended up with a prayer and then he said, And God prosper the cause. Well, we were ready to fight the British then and there. But the fighting would have to wait. The sun had set. But the very next day, September the 11th, 1777, we fought those redcoats at Brandywine. We showed them we weren't going to give up our liberties without a fight. 
And that young preacher that had preached that sermon the night before, he was right there with us, fighting for liberty. He was killed that day. He died at the age of 25, fighting for what he believed in. So when I tell you that we preachers were willing to take our stand, even at places like Brandywine, it's not an overstatement. Uh, the king, of course, King George, hated us for it. He, he hated us. In fact, he said, well, this is nothing more than a Presbyterian rebellion. We thought it funny that he blamed the whole thing on the Presbyterians. The son of the British Prime Minister, Horace Walpole, told Parliament, he said, there's no use in crying about it. Cousin America has eloped with a Presbyterian parson. Uh, some of you may be wondering, well, where did the title Black Robe Regiment come from? Well, it actually came from an American who sided with the British. We called them Tories. We didn't like them very much. We considered them turncoats. Peter Oliver was the one. He was referring, of course, to our preaching robes. He intended it to be a term of criticism and derision, but it has become, I believe, well, a badge of honor that any man of God should be willing to wear. There was never a regiment of preachers, so don't misunderstand. He was referring to all of us preachers who were fanning the flames for liberty and leading our men off to fight. That's who we are. Now, some of you may be saying, well, why is it that I haven't heard about you men? Well, I'm here to tell you there's a lot of your history that you have not been taught. Let me illustrate to you. Let's begin with April the 18th, 1775. There are a number of American colonists riding through the countryside of Massachusetts that night yelling, the regulars are out, the regulars are coming. Well, one of those riders was named Revere, Paul Revere. Now maybe you know something about Mr. Revere. But did you know that when he rode into Lexington, Massachusetts late that night of April the 18th, he rode right up to the preacher's house. Now, this is where Pastor Jonas Clark, the preacher in Lexington, lived. Now, why in the world would Revere ride up to his house? Well, you see, Preacher Clark, along with the help of a deacon named John Parker, had been training the men of Lexington how to fight together as soldiers. It was actually happening all over New England. They were calling themselves Minute Men. Who forgot to tell you that the famous Lexington Minute Men were trained and led by a preacher and a deacon? Oh, but the plot thickens. The night that Revere rides up to Preacher Clark's house, Preacher Clark has two special guests staying with him, Mr. Samuel Adams, Mr. John Hancock. Revere knew that they would be willing to take a stand, and so they had a little council of war and began to talk about what they should do the next day. Well, finally, as they began to discuss it, they finally asked Preacher Clark, well, will the men fight? He said, I trained them for this very hour, and they will fight, and if need be, die too under the shadow of the house of God. So it was settled. Maybe they wouldn't pull triggers and fire on the British, but they would stand there with loaded flintlocks to send the message, we're not going to take this sitting down. Now, Mr. Hancock actually wanted to go out and fight, and they had to restrain him, telling him he had other jobs in the effort. So the very next day, April the 19th, 1775, a statue stands today where Jonas Clark's church once stood, a statue now of Captain Parker stands. About 77 Lexington men were there waiting at the second alarm that was sounded, and they were looking down the muskets of between 700 and 800 British redcoats, outnumbered 10 to 1. It would have been suicidal to open fire. So Captain Parker and Preacher Clark believed that they had made their point, and so they told the Lexington men, men, go on back to your homes. And so as the Lexington men turned and began to walk away, someone discharged a pistol. Now, very few people carry pistols in those days except officers. Assuming that it was a British officer, that was the first shot fired. Well, the Redcoats took it as a signal to open fire. And if you can believe it, they began to shoot into the backs of those Lexington men. So the Lexington men did the only thing they could do. They turned and returned fire. The Battle of Lexington was on, and our War of Independence had officially begun. After that short little skirmish, eight of those Lexington men had done exactly what their preacher had said they would do. They had died under the shadow of the church house. Another 10 had been wounded. How fitting is it that the first official shots of our War of Independence were fired by Americans led by a preacher and a deacon fighting the British in the churchyard right there at Lexington.
That is a part of our history that you need to know. Now, if you know, later that day the British went on to Concord because that was their primary objective. They were going there to confiscate some cannons. The citizens had heard all about it and they hid the cannons out in the woods. But I'll tell you what the Redcoats did find. They found the Continental Militia standing on Barrett Hill overlooking the Old North Bridge. And if you can believe it, a preacher lived about 200 yards from that bridge. His name was Pastor William Emerson. You might recognize him because his grandson, Ralph Waldo Emerson, became a famous poet and wrote the Concord Hymn. Now what is that preacher doing up there with a militia? Well, he's there to encourage them. He said to them, men, if we're going to die, then let us die here, but we must stand our ground. Well, eventually, they marched down off that hill and they engaged those red coats. And I'm here to tell you, gave them a licking for sure. So much so that those red coats began to march all the way back to Boston, some 17 miles. But other Minutemen groups had heard about what had happened at Lexington. Now they're lining the road leading back to Boston, many of them led by preachers, and they began to fire away at the red coats. They fought a running battle all the way back to the outskirts of Boston. I hear they've preserved a part of that road, and you can go there and visit it today. It's called Battle Road. So you see, the church was there on day one. A few weeks later, just outside of Boston, there was another fight. I believe that you call it the Battle of Bunker Hill. It was actually originally fought on Breed's Hill. It ended up on the secondary Bunker Hill. You remember the famous painter I mentioned, Mr. Trumbull? Well, he painted another well-known painting of a poignant moment in that battle. And if you look to the far left of that painting, there is a gentleman that is surrounded by staffs and rifles. And if you look closely, you'll notice that he's wearing preaching bands like I had on a moment ago. Well, that's because Mr. Trumbull knew the role that the churches and the pastors played and he wanted to include a preacher in the painting. This is Dr. Samuel McClintock. He was there from New Hampshire. By the time the war was over, three of his four sons had died in the struggle for liberty. He was not the only pastor who was there. David Avery was there from Vermont, standing on the ramparts with his hands lifted up to heaven so his men could see him praying that God would give them the victory while musket balls whizzed all around him. We were there front and center. But there were others who were there and there were things that we should have done that we didn't do at the right time. And one of them was to recognize the equality of all men. If you'll notice in this painting, over to the far right if you can see it, there's a black man standing behind another man. There's the section of it. Well, who is that? Well, that is a man who was a free man. His name was Peter Salem. And he fought. He fought in our war of independence. But he wasn't the only one. Crispus Attucks was the first black man, I think, killed in our struggle. He was the first casualty of a war of independence killed in the Boston Massacre. You have... Prince Estabrook, who was a black free man who fought at Lexington. You even had in the spy ring of General Washington a very wonderful man who was also a free black man. His name was James Armistead and he was a spy for us. And his efforts were so important that he contributed directly to our victory at Yorktown, forcing the surrender of Mr. Cornwallis. And even Lemuel Haynes, who was a black man, fought in our Continental Army. In those days, very few black men could pastor churches. But after the war, if you can believe this, he became the first black pastor of a white congregation. So even though we did not deal with the slavery issue when we should have, those men fought because they knew their greatest opportunity for liberty was if we won. Did you know that the 28th grievance that we were going to include in the Declaration was criticizing King George that he wouldn't allow us to make slavery illegal in the colonies. Most people don't know that. So you see, we were fighting for liberty. And others knew that their liberty was dependent on our victory. Well, let me tell you about this preacher. This is a preacher by the name of Naphtali Daggett. He was the president of Yale. When the British invaded New Haven, Connecticut, he had about 100 boys from the school rode out and they fired a number of shots at the British to slow their advance so the citizens of New Haven could evacuate. They captured old Daggett. And even though he was a preacher, hated him for it, beat him so brutally that he never recovered. He died a few months later. This is preacher John Adams from Durham, New Hampshire. Before the war ever got started, he and some of the men from his church went out and gathered up all the ammunition and hid it so the British couldn't get it. I'm told that they hid the gunpowder under his pulpit. Now get this. 
Every Sunday when he's preaching these fiery sermons, he's standing on hundreds of pounds of gunpowder. It's a wonder he hadn't made a spark, blown the church sky high. But I hear your modern preachers preach such watered down sermons, they'd be in no such danger. You couldn't make a fire with them if you doused them with kerosene and threw a torch on them. But not preachers in my day. You see, we didn't believe in this, what is it you call it, separation of church and state? What in the world is that? And let me tell you what the kind of correctness we were worried about. It wasn't political correctness. It was biblical correctness. That's what we were concerned about. Well, I could tell you about many, many others. John Treadwell. Uh, here's, here's a preacher from Lynn, Massachusetts. I'm told that he kept a loaded flintlock like this one. This one happens to be a 78 caliber that was carried by Lieutenant William Perkins at the Battle of Bunker Hill. So he kept a flintlock like this leaning in his pulpit. And I'm told that every Sunday when he walked up to preach, he had his Bible tucked under one arm and his cartridge box under the other. He wanted to be fully loaded for whatever fight came his way. Pastor Jonathan French from Andover, Massachusetts, when he heard about Bunker Hill, you know what he did? He resigned his church, went home, got his flintlock and his medical bag and joined the Continental Army. I could tell you story after story after story. We were bold men. Probably best illustrated by this preacher. This is a crude drawing of Pastor John Cleveland from Ipswich, Massachusetts. See, King George hated us preachers. Oh, hated us. And so he made the British general Thomas Gage the, well, I'd call him the dictator of Massachusetts. At least that's my opinion. Well, he didn't make it very easy on the preachers because... As I told you, he hated the preachers. Well, Cleveland wanted to write a letter of protest, but now how's he going to get a letter to General Gage? I mean, how are you going to do that? And then he landed on the idea. Why, he would just publish the letter in the newspaper, and not only could General Gage read the letter, but all the citizens could read the letter as well. I want you to get just a little taste of what Pastor John Cleveland wrote to General Gage. General Gage. Thou profane, wicked monster of falsehood. Your late infamous proclamation is as full of notorious lies as a toad or a rattlesnake of deadly poison. You are an abandoned wretch. Without speedy repentance, you will have an aggravated damnation in hell. Boy, that's political correctness through and through, isn't it? Why don't you tell us what you really think, Pastor? Do you realize that he could have been executed for that? But I don't guess he cared. And let me tell you why. There was a day when pastors cared more about principle and honor than they did applause and approval. And that was my day. And had we not, had my generation not felt that way, you would probably be living in a very different land than the one you are living in today. Well, I must move on and tell you some of these other stories. It wasn't just Presbyterians and Lutherans. Oh no, Baptists got in on it. A preacher like Charles Thompson, pastor at Warren, Rhode Island, when they came into Warren, you know what the British did? They burned his church and his house. They did this in many of the towns that they came in to occupy, destroying the very places of worship. Well, so what did he do? Well, Preacher Thompson joined the Continental Army. Unfortunately, he was captured and he was thrown on a prison ship. I don't know how much you know about those, but those were terrible places. If you ask me, those men met a fate worse than death itself. Over 12,000 of our patriots died on those prison ships. The number one death rate was among preachers. They hated us. You see, freedom isn't free. It comes with a very high price tag. Another Baptist preacher out of Hopewell, New Jersey, Pastor Joab Houghton, pastor of this very church right here. That's his church. Four days after the battles of Lexington and Concord on April the 23rd, 1775, word reached New Jersey about what had happened. So preacher Houghton stood on this very rock right here. Today, that's the top of a memorial. In those days, it's out in front of his church. And he stood there and he said to the men of his church, Men of New Jersey! The Redcoats are brother, uh, murdering our brethren of New England. Who follows me to Boston? I'm told that every man in Houghton's church went home and got their flintlocks and followed their preacher off to fight for liberty. This was happening all over the colonies. It was preachers like me and Houghton and others 
who were with the troops and General Washington at Valley Forge in that, whew, that terribly cold winter of 1777-78 when we didn't think it was ever going to warm up and stop snowing. And so we ministered to General Washington and the staff, the troops, as they continued to march and drill, knowing that we had to live to fight again that next spring. And I'm convinced, had it not been for the ministry of we preachers at Valley Forge, the army would have not lived to fight that next spring. I'm told that if you visit Valley Forge today, you can actually tour the reconstructed Muhlenberg Brigade barracks, where my men and I, Spent that the terribly cold winter while we were freezing and starving to death. All for what we believed in. Yeah, we were fighters. I think you're figuring that out. Best illustrated by this preacher right here. This is Reverend Thomas Allen. As you can see, he was not only the chaplain, but he was the commander of the Berkshire Militia. To illustrate his bravery, on August the 16th, 1777, the Battle of Bennington, Vermont, he led his men out onto the battlefield wearing his preaching robe. Once he got his men positioned, he walked out into the killing zone between the two armies, jumped up on a stump. His men thought he'd lost his mind. He surveyed the British and gave them the opportunity to surrender before telling his men to open fire. Well, some of them recognized him. and They said, well, there's old preacher Allen. Somebody ought to pop him. If you can believe it, the Redcoats fired a volley of musket fire at Preacher Allen while he stood there. Musket balls whizzing all around him. It's a miracle that he wasn't hit, although one did put a hole through his hat. And so I'm told that he went back and stood beside his brother Joseph and he said to his brother, Joe, now you know that I'm a better shot than you, so you load and I'll shoot. And he and his brother fought side by side all day long at the Battle of Bennington, Vermont. When the battle was over, that preacher helped to care for the wounded. And then at the end of the week, he had to saddle up and ride a number of miles back to his church because he had to preach. Well, when he got there, he realized that just standing and fighting was not going to be enough because he had another enemy to fight. An irate church member said, Preacher, I need to have a word with you. He said, well, okay, fine. What is it? And he said, well, I heard the other day over there at Bennington that you fought like a common soldier. The preacher Allen said, well, of course, every man had to do his duty. He said, but you're a preacher. Surely you didn't kill anybody, did you? Preacher Allen said, I don't know if I killed anybody or not. But I did notice behind a particular bush that there was a frequent flash, and every time that flash occurred, one of our men would fall. So I took steady aim, and I fired at that bush. I don't know if I killed anybody, but I put out that flash. And that was Pastor... <laughs> Thomas Allen. These were the kinds of men that pastored our churches when our country was birthed. Now some of you are probably saying, well, where in the world did preachers like you come from? Well, you see, a few decades before our war and our declaration of independence, there was a revival that swept across the colonies. Churches were experiencing something fresh from God. Hundreds of men and women were being born into God's kingdom. And some of us black robe guys were boys then. And we grew up in that kind of environment when some of the greatest preachers in our history were preaching. Men like, well, like Jonathan Edwards preaching sermons like sinners in the hands of an angry God. And so when the time came to fight, we were ready. We were ready. Well, before my part of this talk is finished tonight, I'd like to tell you about one of my brothers. You see, I had a number of brothers, and I was not the only preacher in our family. I told you a while ago my father, Henry, helped to found the Lutheran Church in Pennsylvania. Well, I had a brother named Frederick who was a preacher, not out in the country like me, but in New York City. He was what I would call a fancy pants preacher. And he said to our other family members that it was beneath the man of a cloth to do what I was doing, to get engaged in politics and war. Well, I'll tell you right now, it, it angered me some. And so I, I wrote a letter back to my brother and I said, well, wouldn't you sooner fight like a man than die like a dog? Well, I don't know if what I said to him or my example made a difference, 
And I don't know if he saw the light, but he soon felt the heat because not long after that, the British invaded New York. And you know what they did when they invaded that city? They did what they did in most others. They either desecrated or burned the churches. And my brother Frederick barely got out of there alive with his family. Now what does my fancy pants preacher have to say about getting involved? Well, having barely escaped with his life and the lives of his family members, my brother Frederick joined the Continental Congress immediately. And then he became a member of the Pennsylvania House of Representatives. And my brother, who said that preachers shouldn't get involved, became the first Speaker of the House of the United States of America and is one of the original signers of the Bill of Rights. Quite a shift, wouldn't you agree? But what was it that changed my brother? Here's what I think. I think he got pinched. I think he got pinched so hard that it hurt. Here's my question to you in your day. How hard will you have to be pinched before you finally get engaged? You see, the preachers and the churches of my day were engaged. Will yours do the same? Will you do the same? Friends, I, uh, I've been a preacher since I was 16. I uh, went to college, started pastoring when I was, well, serving in, in a church on a staff when I was 22. Pastored my first church at the age of 24. I'll turn 62 in just a few weeks. And through all that time, through most of it, I never heard about Peter Muhlenberg. I didn't know he existed. I had no idea that the Lexington Minutemen were trained and led by a preacher and a deacon. I didn't know any of this stuff. How is it that I could live my whole life practically and not know about the role that preachers and churchmen played in our war of independence and, and the birthing of our republic, how could I not know that? How could I not know that Presbyterians like this preacher, William Smith said, we know that our religious and our civil rights are linked together in one indissoluble bond and will either flourish or fall together in America. How could I not know that? This is why those preachers preached election sermons. When was the last time you heard an election sermon? If you're a preacher, when was the last time that you preached an election sermon? See, I've come to understand that our liberties, like a train, they run on two rails. And when you read the framers, you'll hear them say over and over and over, civil and religious liberty. And as long as those two rails are secure, the, the train of state can run right down the tracks. But you let one of those rails be given up, and you know what happens to that train runs off the tracks. Look at what's happening around us today. The train has run off the tracks. Because we're surrendering. We're thinking that somehow, well, we're safe in our churches. Well, another black robe preacher who didn't fight on the battlefield, but he fought in the halls of legislation because he was a member of the Continental Congress. His name was John Witherspoon. He was a Presbyterian preacher, but he was also the president of what became Princeton University. Here's what he said. There's not a single instance in history in which civil liberty was lost and religious liberty was preserved. Now you need to get that. You need to understand that. The church cannot sit here while civil liberty is being ripped away from us and think we're going to remain safe in our churches. Those liberties are so woven together, you cannot tear one away without destroying the other. If I were to ask you, what are the three institutions that God created so we could have a civil society? I bet all of you could get it right. The home, the state, and the church. All three institutions of God. All three equally worthy of being preached and taught about from Scripture. And yet for the last hundred years or so, we've told preachers, you can't preach politics in the pulpit. So during that period of time, that institution has risen up and it's trying to exterminate the other two. And so you have government now attacking the family and attacking the church. 
A pastor in Baton Rouge, Louisiana just barely got out of spending 18 years in prison. I know him well. His name is Pastor Tony Spell. In Baton Rouge, Louisiana, was arrested 33 times, fought his way all the way through the Louisiana court system, lost at every turn, and only in the 5th U.S. District Court of Appeals did he finally find satisfaction. You know what his crime was? He wouldn't close his church. 33 arrests, under house arrest at times, wearing an ankle brace in America. Don't think it cannot happen here. The historians before the war between the states knew this. Look at this, 1862, Frank Moore. The preachers of the revolution did not hesitate to attack the great political and social evils of their day. Today, you can't get most preachers to touch those issues with a 10-foot pole. Two years before that, John Wingate Thornton emphasizes her mind where he said the fathers of the republic did not divorce politics and religion, but they denounced the separation as ungodly. What are we told today? The exact opposite. We're told separate the church and state. And if you mix those two, that's the big sin. And so while we're not teaching our people what God says about proper government, they think it's either unimportant, they shouldn't be involved in it, or it's unworthy of the church and the pulpit. No wonder why Americans don't understand our form of government. No wonder why American Christians do not get engaged. The late pastor from Memphis, Tennessee, Adrian Rogers, said it like this, It was God who created human government. It's therefore inconceivable that He would create government and then tell His people to stay out of it. But that is exactly what we've been doing for decades. Well, politics is a dirty business. Of course it is. We removed all the salt and light. Jesus said, you are the salt of the world. You are the light of the world. Without salt and light, what happens? Things decay and grow dark. And that is what has happened. The church has retreated and the wicked have filled the vacuum. Some people often say, well, Dan, you don't want a theocracy, do you? Of course not. Look at what the church has done to the church. I don't want them to do that to government. I mean, gosh, we made a mess of it. But here's the thing. Who would you rather have governing you? The godless or the godly. What does the Bible say? When the righteous are in power, the people rejoice. But when the wicked rule, what do the people do? They mourn, they grieve. What happens when the church goes silent? We're the conscience of the culture. Well, look at Germany. The church in Germany was too busy trying to make deals with the Nazis. Look at these pictures of cardinals and bishops giving the Heil Hitler salute. I guess they thought that if they could stay neutral and make friends or make nice with the Nazis, they'd be okay. Well, how did that work out? Not so well. It was a dark day. Oh, there were a few lights, like this Lutheran preacher, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, actually was involved in the efforts to assassinate Hitler because he knew that Hitler was not a minister of God, but was a minister of Satan in a position of government, and he had no reservations about standing up against a tyrant like Hitler. But he gave his own life for it two weeks before the Allied forces liberated the camp where he was being held. That's what happens when the church goes silent. Samuel Adams once said something that's incredibly prophetic. He said, if ever a time should come that vain and aspiring men possess the highest seats in government, our country will stand in need of its most experienced patriots to prevent its ruin. You know what he's talking about? Us! He's talking about us. If you know Christ, and I would assume that most of us do, you've been liberated internally by the blood of Jesus and you are free from your sin. Well, of all people, we ought to be liberty lovers then. And we ought to be leading the fight for external liberty. Instead, we bring up the caboose if we're even on the tracks at all. And so the church has slept while the left leftist Marxists have not. And our children are on the verge of living in a Marxist country. Friends, don't think it can't happen. There are many countries all over the world that thought it couldn't happen. And it did. And we're close. Now why is it that preachers won't speak out? Well, we could guess. But in 2014, the Christian pollster George Barna, who I've come to know and appreciate, did a scientific study, and he asked preachers all over the country, about 500 preachers, he said, does the Bible address the social ills of our day? And about 90% of them said yes, meaning 
That other 10%, I don't know what in the world they're reading. But anyway, 90%. And then he followed up by saying, are you going to preach on them? And about 90% of them said, not a chance. So he said, why are you not going to preach on these things? You know what the top two reasons that the pastors gave? They said, number one, it'll hurt our attendance. And number two, it'll hurt the size of our offerings. You think Jesus died for either one of those? That's the answer that a hireling would give. Jesus says the good shepherd will lay his life down for the sheep. This is why pastors will not speak out. Among my own Baptist brethren, most of them won't even allow me in their churches. They don't want their people to hear this because they know that their people will then expect them to do something. And that will mess up their tea times at the golf course. Tell you, friends, it's where we are. You may not like it. It may not be welcome words to you, but that's where we are. But that can change if the church will begin to stand up. So to close our presentation tonight, I want you to go back with me in time. Let's go back to the 18th century. And let's, uh, let's go visit a, a special place. You say, where are we going? Well, we're going to the wilderness of New Jersey. <laughs> We're going to go to a place called the Forks of the Delaware where a preacher by the name of John Rosbrug lived. He lived in that very house. We don't have a portrait of him, but we do have a portrait of his son, James. John Rosbrug was 63 when the war broke out. He was not regular military like Peter Muhlenberg. He would not have worn a colonel's coat. He had worn some type of civilian clothing and probably rather than wearing certainly a military tricorn hat he would have worn a, a parson's hat and he would have looked uh, would he have looked something like like this and rather than my telling you his story let me allow him to tell you his story i had been preaching these principles in my pulpit for years we could see the war approaching we tried everything that we could do to avoid it, but finally, it became unavoidable. So, knowing that we had to take a stand, I told the younger men in my church, Men, if you will go fight, I will stay behind and take care of your families. I'm 63. I'm a little too old to go marching off to war. I thought that was a reasonable position to hold. And it was until the Battle of Long Island, New York where the British nearly destroyed General Washington and our men. I realized then every able-bodied man was going to have to do his duty. And so I called the men of my church together. And I said, men, we must rally to the aid of liberty and to General Washington. My men said, preacher, we will go if you will lead us. And I said, it will be my distinct honor. And so at the age of 63, we saddled up. We rode off to find General Washington in the army. We found him outside of Trenton, New Jersey. And we were a part of the Battle of Trenton. Most people don't know, but about a week after that battle, the Hessians, who were German mercenaries, the British had brought over about 50,000 of them, ruthless soldiers on the battlefield. It brought them over to terrorize us, and it worked. We were, we were horrified by having to stand up to the Hessians. Well, those Hessians and the British, about a week later, tried to retake Trenton in what we call the Second Battle of Trenton. And during that fight, I became separated from our forces by a creek trapped over on the British side. My story was told later by a Hessian soldier who ran into Trenton, New Jersey, bragging that he had helped kill a rebel priest. Let me tell you what happened. I decided that if I tried to cross that creek in the daylight, the British would capture me for sure. And if they did, they'd kill me. That's what they did to most of us preachers. They caught us on the battlefield. So I decided to just ride and hopefully evade the British. And then come sundown, well, I could make a mad dash across that creek. They'd hear me. But by the time I was across, I'd be safe and there wouldn't be anything they could do. And so I did. I, I evaded capture. Finally, late that afternoon, I, I hadn't had anything to drink, nothing to eat. And so I rode up to a tavern and I thought I had securely tied off my horse. And I went inside the tavern to find me something. And, and I did. And once I was able to get a little liquid in me and something to eat, I came back outside. And if you could believe it, 
my horse was gone. <laughs> well, I couldn't take someone else's horse. And so I began walking through the trees trying to find that horse because I knew, trapped on the wrong side of that creek, flat-footed, I'm a dead man. Well, I pushed through a particular thicket of brush, and when I got through to the other side, you will never believe what I found. <laughs> I found a squad of Hessian soldiers commanded by a British officer. I wanted to run. There was nowhere to go. I was caught. Well, I knew what they intended to do probably, and so I began to beg them to take me as their prisoner. I said, I have a family. I have a church. They just laughed. And I saw that they meant to kill me. And so I asked them if I could pray first. And in my surprise, they agreed. And so I, uh, I knelt there on that damp ground. What do you pray when you're about to meet a very brutal death? <laughs> I didn't know. But I, I prayed like maybe you would. I, I just began to pray out loud. I said, Lord, please receive my soul, which is about to come to you. Please take care of my family, my church. Lord, help us to win this fight. We've got to win this fight. About then, I remembered the words of Jesus on the cross. You remember when he asked the Father not to blame those who crucified him? I looked up and the Hessians had moved in very close for the kill. And I said, Lord, please do not blame these men for my death. You know, you would think that that might have softened those old cold, hard Hessian hearts. Didn't make a dent. Just as soon as I was finished with my prayer, the British commander yelled at them and said, Take him! And they began to bayonet me. When my body was found later, it had 17 bayonet wounds, three sword wounds across my face. One of the bayonets was driven into my body and the Hessian, in anger, broke it off in my corpse. My body was actually reburied off the battlefield in Trenton, New Jersey by a black robe preacher by the name of George Duffield along with my wife and her brother, where I await the resurrection. See, when we... When we rode off to fight for liberty, we knew that some of us would probably be, be wounded. Some of us could be killed. But you know, you just kind of put that out of your mind. You just don't think about that. The truth is, many of us preachers paid with our lives and our churchmen so that you can have the freedoms that you have today. Now, if my generation was willing to die for liberty, is it too much to ask yours to speak up and stand up for it? Is that too big of a request? Tonight, my friends, we have heard some amazing stories. We've heard the story of John Rossbrook, who died while trying to surrender to the British. Joab Trout, the preacher who died at Brandywine. James and Hannah Caldwell, you remember the British killed them in cold blood. Jonas Clark's eight minute men. Samuel McClintock's three sons. Charles Thompson, the Baptist preacher, and even the president of Yale, Naphtali Daggett. They're just a fraction of the men and women in our churches that died so that we can enjoy the freedoms that we do today. This is why even though I have plenty enough to do, I don't need to do other things, I go around this country telling this story. Because you see, this story must be told. The story of the men and women who stood up to fight for our liberties. And so what I want to do is I want to pray with you. And I want you to ask the Lord, what is it that God would have you to do? Would God have you to stand?
Because I believe the answer is he would. Now, some of you ought to run for office at the local level, city council, school board. We've witnessed over the last year the damage those people can do if they don't understand the proper role of government. Some of you ought to run for our legislature. Some of you ought to run for positions in county government. You say, well, Dan, I'm not cut out for that. Well, all right, then help find some who are and help them get elected. And then stand with them. Do you remember in the Old Testament when Isaiah said he heard the voice of the Lord and the Lord said, who will go? Who will we send? And Isaiah said, here I am. Send me. That's the spirit that we must have. If we do not, mark my words, our children and our grandchildren will be slaves to leftist ideology. It is coming, my friends. It's not inevitable. We still hold the key. But if we don't speak up, just like in the 18th century, there will be no home of the free. There will be no home of the brave. That will be all past history. So I'm going to ask you if you would, would you bow your heads with me? And we're going to pray. And we're going to ask the Lord if He would speak to us. If He would move in our hearts. And if we could hear the voice of the Lord saying, Who will I send? And who will go for me? There's a call for men to be in a land where all are free. There is hope for liberty if we go. Father, we come to you tonight in the name of Jesus. There's a dream. And we want to first thank you for the freedom that is found in you. Freedom from our sin, from our, our corruption. And we thank you, Lord, for everyone here who knows you. If there is one here who is not sure that they know you as Savior and Lord, maybe before this night is over, they would come to know you as their own Lord and Savior. But Lord, for those of us who have been set free by your blood, we should be the greatest lovers of liberty in this great land. God, we have not been faithful. We have not been willing to go. For that matter, we have been willing to speak out. And so, Father, I pray tonight that you would raise up the spirit of the old Black Robe Regiment in us. Oh, no one wants a battle with bullets and bombs. We're not praying for that. But, Lord, we're in a fight. We're in a fight for the soul of this land. And no, all the answers are not in government. But Lord, I don't want my children, my grandchildren to live in a Marxist nightmare. God, help your church to stand up and to do what we're called to do. And Lord, in the words of old Joab Trout, September the 10th, 1777, God, I pray that you would indeed prosper the cause. I pray it in the awesome and wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for allowing me to come tonight and share the story of the Black Robe Regiment. God bless you as we stand together for liberty. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you.